All right, so uh, again, I want to thank you for your patience as we try to make communion, have communion be more central to our service. Um, we discussed this for a while. We had a class series over communion. We took a look at how the, the covenant sacrifices of the Old Testament are directly related to the covenant sacrifice that Jesus is for us and how Jesus establishes, of course, again, that relationship between us and God. But it's not just to establish, to establish a relationship between us and God. It also establishes a relationship with each other. Uh, and in the early church, the first century church, communion was very prob- central to their services, uh, that they would engage one another, they would, they would pray for one another, they would have dedicated time to interact with one another. So that's the idea that we are going to have a dedicated time for communion, communion with God, uh, but communion with each other. And I realize, you know, we're going to have to probably change a few things for fluidity's sake. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and announce this for next week. Same structure, all right? So 9 a.m. we'll have the class. We'll have that in the fellowship hall. But I think next week what we'll do is we'll have communion in here. Uh, so that way it's just simpler, more fluid. We'll have communion in here, and then of course songs, sermon following. Uh, And again, that fellowship that happens, right? When we take the bread, take the cup, when we pray, maybe read some scripture, maybe sing some songs, and the fellowship that then happens after, it can happen in here. You can go in there. You can have fellowship there. And again, the practical application I just talked about is, one, bear one another's burdens. How do we do that? Pray for one another. So as you're interacting with each other, As you're conversing with each other, if you hear something like, hey, somebody's talking to you, they're a little worried about their parents, maybe they they have anxiety in their life right now, maybe say, hey, how about I pray for that right now? Or that's the idea, a practical application of how we can bear one another's burdens in this time of communion. All this being said, let me pray before we get into our text. God, you are good and you alone are good. Lord, I pray that you would bless our fellowship, that we would grow together as the body of Christ, grow in maturity in Christ. I pray that as we bear one another's burdens, we would feel loved, be loved, that we'd extend grace to others as we have had grace extended to us. Lord, we are mindful that we do not deserve your blessing of Christ, and with that in mind, we do not boast and we extend love to others as we have been loved by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Am I loud enough? I can't tell. Maybe it's just the, the difference between here and, and there. I don't know. I just felt like I'm a little bit low. Yeah, it was plenty loud in there. Anyway, uh, all, all this being said, now maybe I'm a little too loud. That's <laughs> okay. Um, in our text, John 13, we're going to do something a little bit different. I I usually don't do this. I usually just preach through the text, like verse by verse. That's usually how I go. Uh, But we're going to take a little different approach. We're going to take the first block of text. We're going to skip over what I'm going to call the meat of the passage. Then we're going to take a look at the the bookend of the text. So John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 21 through 38. That is the block of text we will deal with today. And in this text, we're going to read of a betrayer and a denier. There is one who dies under the influence of the devil. There's another who denies Jesus, but that's not the end of the denier's story. But one thing is true of both. Both of them cannot. They're unable to come to where Jesus is, at least not until Jesus accomplishes his work on the cross. I've said this several times, a lot of times. Without Jesus' redemptive work, we have no hope. Right? Without Jesus' death on the cross, we may not be saved. And this truth has been sprinkled throughout the Gospel of John. John chapter 6, verse 44, something we've taken a look at. I've beaten so much, emphasized so much. John 6, 44, it says, No one can come to me. Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day day. All right, so you get what that's saying there. We are unable to, we cannot come to him. We cannot be saved unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then in John chapter 12, verse 32, to connect this back to John 6 again, this is what Jesus is saying here. He says, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And we noted several weeks ago how the word for draw in chapter 12 and chapter 6 is the same word for draw. 
Right, so without Jesus' drawing, right, without what Jesus does on the cross, without him being lifted up and then drawing all people to himself, we cannot be saved. Now, where do I get that? John chapter 6 says, oh, the Father's got to draw you. And John chapter 12, verse 32 says, the Son's got to draw you. Well, the Son's drawing is the Father's drawing, because in John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So that's where I get this idea that the Son's drawing is the Father's drawing, because the Son does what the Father, (laughs) what he sees the Father doing. So without Jesus' drawing... Right, without Jesus going to the cross, being lifted up, drawing all people to himself, we cannot be saved. Right, we're not saved on the basis of our work, we're saved on the basis of his work. And not only are we saved on that basis, but we may love, the basis of our love is his work. Right, we cannot love as he loved, as he has loved, if he does not, if he did not go to the cross. So Jesus' love is not only the basis for our salvation, but it is also the basis for our love for one another. I'm going to say that again. I want to be abundantly clear, all right? We cannot love without his work. So let's take a look at the text. We're going to first read about the betrayer and the denier. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at verses 21 through 30. We're going to read that text, 21 through 30, then we're going to skip, go to verses 36 through 38, and then we're going to revisit verses 31 through 35. So, John chapter 13, starting in verse 21, it says, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Troubled in his spirit, he's deeply anxious, he's filled with grief, he's deeply troubled, I think this is a time that absolutely highlights his humanity, right? To, to be in such anxiety, I'm sure we can all identify with anxiety a bit. Anxiety is talked about a lot, in, a lot nowadays, and I get it, right? I'm sure we all have been anxious, and imagine this time. As I mentioned last week with Jesus, he, he, he's in this situation, and he's in complete control, right? This is not a situation that's outside of Jesus' control, so you can imagine, yeah, he's going to be anxious, he knows what's going to happen, and yet he's, he's submitting to himself to what is about to happen. So I can understand this anxiety, especially when you consider that there's about to be a betrayal. A betrayal of somebody close to him. A friend. Uh, a friend that's seen his works. A friend that not only has seen his works, but a friend who has done work for him that friend will betray him. And I imagine we've all felt betrayal before. We know what that feels like. Somebody that you've invested in so much, you've got emotional ties to, and then they stab you in the back. But not only have we felt that, I'm, I'm sure, in fact, I know that we've been on the flip side of that. We've been close to people, and we've been that betrayer. Verse, thir- or verse 22, as we continue on here, it says, The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. In the Greek here, it's kind of like uh, they're just lost for words, at a loss for words. Like, really, man, thinking to themselves, one of us? One of us is going to betray you, Jesus, after all that happened? <laughs> we, we saw you do all these signs, these miracles. How would one of us betray you? And again, not to mention that not only did they see signs that Jesus did, they went out, they were sent out and did signs themselves by the power of Christ. So after all of that, one of us will betray you. Verses 23 and 24, it says, One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to, him at, to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. We're going to hear of this disciple whom Jesus loved four more times at the end of this gospel. It's kind of uh, John's humble brag, his subtle way of identifying himself. And here, of course, they're reclining at table. Keep in mind that this is the Last Supper. This is the Lord's Supper, <laughs> what we call communion, what we repeat, communion, a time of intimacy, A time of intimacy with Jesus, a time of intimacy with each other. 
they're reclining at table. There's somebody there that's going to betray Jesus. And, and Peter, he's concerned. Who, who's, who's this going to be? And he kind of asks it in a way. He, he gets John, who's uh, reclining by Jesus. We kind of miss out how they're reclining. I'm not going to get on the floor. I don't want to do that. But they, they kind of would be angled towards the table with their left arm down, propping them up as they would eat with their right arm. That's usually how that would go. And so presumably Jesus is over here by John. John is in front of Jesus. And so Peter, maybe subtly, he's trying to get John like, hey, uh, what, what's he talking about? Maybe not wanting to call anybody out in front of the other disciples. So we continue on, verses 25 and 26. It says, So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he dipped it, the, dipped the morsel of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now one thing is for sure here, it's pretty clear, it's pretty self-evident, that Jesus gives this morsel of bread to Judas to identify him as the betrayer. But why dipped bread? I mean, why the dipped bread? There, you, you can look at the commentaries yourself. You can look at the various interpretations yourself. It, some people suggest, hey, maybe this is a sign of betrayal. Maybe it's a symbol of betrayal. Maybe this is a symbol of honor. I've heard both. It could be a symbol of betrayal. It could be a symbol of honor. But I think we should primarily have Psalm 41, verse 9 in mind as we read Last week, it says, Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. So regardless of the interpretations of what a dipped bread could mean, I think primarily we have in mind that this is fulfilling prophecy. All right, this was prophesied that Jesus was going to give the betrayer this bread, and that would be a symbol that he was going to be betrayed. And the next verse here, verse 27, um, is kind of shocking to me. I don't know about you, but read that. Verse 27, it says, Then after he had taken the morsel of bread, Satan entered into him. Satan entered into him. That is Judas. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Perhaps in this time, you know, Jesus, he's, he's deeply troubled in his spirit. He's filled with anxiety. Maybe it's not just anxiety for what's about to happen to him. Maybe it's anxiety because of what's about to happen to Judas. The Satanas, as the Greek says, the Satanas entered Judas. And this is actually the only time in the Gospel of John that that translation, that word there, that Greek word Satanas is used in the Gospel of John. All other times, John uses diabolos, which is where we get our word diabolical from, meaning slanderer. Here, Satanas means the adversary, the enemy. Uh, there could be a few reasons why he only uses Satanas here. Maybe it's because the devil is now taking more of an active, direct role to, to oppose Jesus. But man, just picturing this time, thinking about the Satan entering into Judas, and then Jesus telling him what you're going to do, do it quickly. Verse 28 and 29. It says, no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. It's interesting that it says that they, they, they didn't know why Jesus said this. I mean, were John and Peter not paying attention? Were they not paying attention? Did you say, hey, I'm going to give him this morsel of bread, and that's the betrayer? Surely, surely they knew that they identified Judas as the betrayer. But I, I don't think that they really understood what was about to happen. They didn't think that Jesus was going to a cross. And they most certainly did not think that one of them, one of the disciples, one of Jesus' closest friends, would be central to sending Jesus to that cross. So yeah, I think, I think Jesus gives them this bread, gives Judas this bread that identifies him as, as the betrayer, but I don't think they realize to what extent that betrayal would go. And as we read in verse 30, this is... Some, sometimes, man, it, it took me a little bit to get this emphasis here. It didn't dawn on me for a while, but verse 30, another haunting verse, it says, So after receiving the morsel of bread... He immediately went out, and it was night. It was night. Why that detail? 
Why, why do we need to know it's night? He didn't have to include that. He could have just said we're having supper today. But specifically, he points out that it was night. I'll give you several reasons why I think he does this. John chapter 12, verse 35 through 36, that text says, So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. John chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Jesus answered them, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. John chapter 8, verse 12 Again, Jesus spoke of them, but spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So in John chapter 13, Judas literally walks off into the night, and spiritually, he is in darkness. See, I don't think John, I don't think the writer of the Gospel of John just put that note without any thought. What's literally happening resembles what is spiritually happening in Judas. He's not of the light. He's in the darkness. He does not know where he is going. Man, I don't know if you read that, and I don't know what you feel. I don't know if you're just (laughs) apathetic or void of any feeling, but man... Just think about what happened to Judas. The situation, I don't know if I would say it terrifies me, but it pains me. Just think about somebody walking off into the darkness, literally and spiritually. Um, I pray that does not happen with any of you. So let's read about the denier. But before we read this, verses 31 through 35, Jesus, he tells them that they cannot go to where he's going. So in verses 36 and 38, we read of the denier. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. You cannot follow now, but you will follow afterward. Afterward, after what? I think in mind, immediately in mind, we obviously have the cross in mind. Peter cannot follow him there. We're going to read this in a a second, but I think it applies to even more than that. I don't think he's just referring to the cross. Verse 37, as we continue, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Overly zealous Peter. (laughs) Jesus, I love you. I love you so much that I would be willing to die for you course we know that that is not true at this time Uh, i don't think peter and the others fully grasped on what jesus was going to do i don't think they had again they didn't have the cross in mind and quite frankly peter what he says here that's in contrast to the plan the plan is not peter die for jesus so you can save jesus the plan is jesus die for peter die for the disciples die for the whole world so that he can save the world that is the plan peter is overly zealous verse 38 it says jesus answered will you lay down your life for me truly truly i say to you the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times would you really peter would you die for me i don't think jesus says this with any condemning tone peter i i know i know who you are i know your heart I know, in fact, you're going to do the opposite of die for me. You're going to deny me. But I think Jesus, he says this knowing that Peter is his. 
He knows that Peter is his. Now, here's a question for you. Why, why can't the disciples go to where Jesus is going? Or so in mind, we have the cross, but why, why can't they do that? Oh, immediately, I, that cross is only for Jesus. <laughs> that cross that saves the world is only for him. It's only something that he can do. It's only something that he can accomplish. But I also think maybe, maybe they can't go because, to an extent, they, they just don't know where, where he's going. Obviously, you can't go to where Jesus is going if you don't know where he is going. But again, I think it all boils down to really this. They can't until Jesus accomplishes his work. So verses 31 and following, verses 31 and 32 when he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. I know that is confusing wording. Often the ESV translation is a little bit weird as far as how it words things. Um, but let me try to break it down for a second. Jesus is God. right? Baseline, we can establish this. Jesus is God, so it makes the sense to say that God is glorified in him if Jesus is God. And verse 32 may be better translated as God will glorify him before himself. Where I get before is the word translated as in can also mean before. So God will glorify him before himself. So Jesus being God, God is glorified in Jesus. But the Father being God, God is also glorified before, or Jesus is also glorified before God. So I don't think that these two verses here are meant to be uh, incoherent. I think this is maybe another way we can see the Trinitarian theology, Father, Son, Spirit being one. Jesus, God is glorified in Jesus, but Jesus is also glorified before God because the Father is God. Regardless, verse 33, it says, Jesus says, little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. You cannot you are unable to come. And Jesus, he's referring back to what he said in John chapter 8, verses 21, and we'll skip ahead to 28, but John chapter 8, verses 21 and 28, that says, so he said to them again, I'm going away and you'll seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father has taught me. Ultimately, that's where they cannot come. Ultimately, they cannot come to the cross upon which Jesus died because Jesus is the only blemishless sacrifice. But notice, notice what Jesus says following verse 33. Verse 34 says, for this is the first half of the verse 34, it says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, immediately in their mind, I think they would be thinking, well, what do you mean, a new commandment? We know this commandment. Leviticus 19, verse 18, that says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. What do you mean, new commandment? We know this. We know our Bible. We know the Old Testament. But I think the second half of verse 34 is what actually makes this new commandment. As verse 34 says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. You love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. See, that's what's new. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. That's new because not a single soul, not a single soul has loved like Jesus. And how much did he love them? He loved them to a cross. He loved them to a cross. I think that's why he says in verse 36, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Or the cross, a, a perfect place of love, where love is ultimately displayed in perfection, you can't follow there. You can't follow me to the cross. You cannot love as I have loved you until I accomplish my work. See, in this passage, I don't think Jesus is just talking about the cross. I think he's talking about this love, this new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. You cannot do that without the work of Christ. 
We don't partake in that love. We don't extend that love. We don't share that love without what Christ accomplished on the cross, not without the work of God. As we continue through chapters 14 through 17, you're going to see this. We don't give this love. We don't share this love without the work of God. And the first John, was after we're done with chapters 14 through 17, we're going to go to first John. We'll see abundantly clear that we cannot love without God's work. It is because of God's work that we may love as we have been loved by him. And as we close here, verse 35. By this, by what? This love. Or the love that, I've display, that I'm going to display on the cross, by that, that kind of love, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, again, love like Jesus, if you have love for one another. And not by a perfect understanding of Scripture. Not by the name on outside, outside of the building. Not by the order of service. Not by who's preaching. Not by dividing ourselves. But by the love you have for one another. I don't, I don't know that we take this verse seriously. Because we make it, you know, people are going to know we're disciples if we do this, 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 this. We'll go on to list everything without a focus on love. If we just keep ourselves away from everybody else, if we divide ourselves, if we say, no, 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 that's not really, that's not really Christ's disciples over there in that building. This is Christ's disciples over here. We miss the point. People will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another, and it's a love that is possible because of his work. I don't think we take this verse seriously. I don't think I've always taken it seriously. We've got division. We hold resentment. We marginalize people because they don't do things exactly as we do things. They don't think exactly as we think. Church, our role, our role is not to separate the fish. We're not the ones in charge of separating fish. We're not the ones in charge of separating the, the sheep from the goats. That's Jesus. So tell me why, then, do we get in that business? Right, instead of loving one another with a love that's empowered by Christ, we get in the business of condemning and separating. All this being said, I pray that you come to this love, receive this love, and realize that this is the love that's empowered by Christ. Or your salvation is completely dependent on Christ's work, but not just your salvation, but also the love that you share is dependent on Christ's work. So come share in this love as we stand and sing.